I am working on a book now that Yale Press will publish on simplistically the search for what John Haydock used to refer to as aura, which we all refer to as poetry, which is basically unteachable. In other words, the unutterable in architecture. Um, and that is something normally taught by and talked about and cogitated over by theologians, by philosophers. Margaret, Margaret McCurry, who couldn't be here, my wife and partner and I are on the visiting committee of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. And a bunch of them came up to see my show at the Graham Foundation, which I guess closes this week. And uh, we went out to dinner. Twelve doctoral candidates, the dean and a faculty member. Um, and it's something they talk about all the time. Uh, so I'm writing about that um, because that's what interests me, uh, the search for what isn't normally discussed in architectural circles. So digitally, I mean, obviously, I, I use a word processor for typing. Actually, it's a cute story about I've been working on a word processor for years. And I had, what is the first one that came out in 1976? Wordstone. Yeah, I had, and it was, it was getting slow, slower and slower. And what is the name of the woman? You, you, you have that business now, too, the technology woman in architecture in Chicago. There's a woman who helps. What? Well, whatever. So I called her and I said, I want an absolutely up-to-date computer, and I want you to lobotomize it. I don't care about anything except typing. And she did. She basically got it down to zero. So I had this incredibly fast word processor, which is what I use. I don't know AutoCAD, Margaret McCurry doesn't know AutoCAD. And if I rattle off the names of my contemporaries, including Frank Gehry and Eisenman and Graves and Stern and all of them, Meyer, none of them are, are on the word processor. But their offices are, and our offices, no question about it. Um, but we all, all of us of my generation, still draw. So in fact, I'm working on a house right now that I'm drawing. Of course, I will turn it over to a kid who will put it on the computer, and then I'll make changes. I mean, do what normal people do. But I don't think the computer is yet at a stage to contend with that subject, aura, or the unspeakable in architecture. I think it may, at some point, get to that stage. But it certainly isn't there now. And you know, like all architects, we have meetings with clients. And I find it difficult to have any paper and pencil in those meetings. For God forbid, one of the kids in the office, all of whom are technology, unbelievably proficient, but none of whom can draw. And if I, you know, God forbid I let them loose in front of a client with a pencil and they would draw a line like this. So we're in a transition time. You're right to ask the question. And at some point, the computer may get to a stage that it actually can deal with what I'm talking about. But at the moment, it can't. And what I'm talking about interests me personally, the business of the unutterable in architecture. So maybe not the answer you want to hear, but that's my answer to the question. Well, it's basically hasn't been articulated in architecture schools either. As I say, theologians and philosophers tend to talk about people in religious studies, divinity schools. Um, actually, it's interesting because at the meeting I had, because I then went out to dinner with this group, uh, with the U of C divinity school people, um, 
I have been talking about to the University of Chicago, because we're doing the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, uh, seeing what their interests are in starting an architecture school. And the reason I talk about the University of Chicago is it is arguably the most intellectual university between the mountain ranges, say. But for the Ivy League and the stuff on the West Coast, Stanford, etc., uh, you could argue, one could argue that the University of Chicago, generally speaking, is as intellectually driven, if not more, than any other institution within spitting distance. Um, and the Divinity School, I, so I talked about it with them, and the dean and the faculty member, who was the former dean, um, were very interested in actually talking about doing an architecture school in conjunction with the Divinity School. I'm being simplistic here. If you know something about the University of Chicago, you know that faculty tend to also be on committees. And these committees are intellectually driven committees. The Committee on Social Thought, the Committee on Practice, etc. So all of the great faculty of the U of C have been on those committees. In fact, there's a very interesting conference starting on Friday that you may not know about run by a fabulous young woman who's in the English department and her specialty is comics and cartoon stuff. So she's interested, because I make these funny drawings, she's interested in my drawings. So all of the great cartoonists are going to be there, Art Spiegelman, Art Crumb, etc. Um, so it's a very interesting faculty. Whether an architecture school would transpire vis-a-vis -vis the Divinity School, it would certainly include them and the Department of Philosophy and Critical Inquiry, particularly uh, Tom Mitchell, W.J.T. Mitchell, who's the editor of Critical Inquiry. Um, so I'm very interested in that. And I think of the University of Chicago. Some years ago, I was on the visiting committee of the School of Architecture at Princeton. And Princeton, you know, if you want to say, often people like Margaret and I and others tend to meet with young kids in high school and they want to go into architecture, say. And my answer to them is basically, what do you want to do? If you're interested in becoming a professional, speaking of the top rank, top tier schools, you want to be a general partner at Skidmore and Merrill, say. You want to go to Harvard. If you're interested in the art of architecture, you want to go to Yale. If you're interested in computers and the most avant-garde stuff, you want to go to Columbia or SciArc. If you're interested in this stuff, you want to go to Princeton. The reason I say that is that Princeton has a doctoral program, which is the way I see the U of C, that's very interesting in architectural history, criticism, and theory. And at any given moment, 12 doctoral candidates will be in residence in the architecture school at Princeton. They're getting a doctorate in architecture. Not in history, of, but not history of architecture, but architecture. And the presence of those 12 doctoral candidates at any given moment has had an immense impact on the architecture students, the MR1 students, people getting a first professional three-year degree. So I thought if you start an architecture school at U of C, you'd start at the doctoral level, working with the departments of philosophy, the divinity school, et cetera, sociology, behavioral issues, and then work your way back down into a three-year master's. So it'd be more like Princeton's program. And there seems to be some real interest down there. I realize this is not, this is not slighting IIT's program. IIT has a new dean. Do we all know who it is? No. Terrific architect. Will Aretz from the Netherlands. Do you know who that is? Anybody else know who that is? It's a fabulous architect, actually. You know. Um, so it's not sliding IIT. Certainly, Somal is doing a spectacular job at, U at UIC. And Larry Booth has his little funny program at Northwestern that I think some of you may know about that's not so interesting. 
because it's more technology driven and actually, Larry's words, not mine, anti-intellectual. It's not interested in critical stuff and so forth. So therefore, I, I have no interest in such a thing. So I think that fleshing out the entirety of the range of architecture schools in this great city, it would be great to do a program that began with the mind at an institution that is similarly driven. You know, architects should, for their own purpose, for their own benefit, teach as well as practice. And I, I say that, I wrote about it in my autobiography, actually. Um, practicing architecture tends to give something to yourself. I mean, yes, you're working for a client, there's a program, etc. But ultimately, what's on your mind finds its way on a paper and onto the computer and then built. Teaching is empowering others. So education and practice are this sort of dialectical couple that you really can't do one without the other and be successful. For example, people in practice who don't teach badmouth people who teach saying that they're not in, interested in building. They have no mind for building, etc. People in practice who don't teach uh, always look down on practitioners. But actually, you should actually do both. Um, I don't think you should teach immediately out of school, but I think your obligation is to teach at some point when you have something to teach. And it's, because it's also a part of giving back. When you empower others, which is about architecture, is ultimately an ethical pursuit. And it's about giving back. And a part of giving back is to empower others. You do that generally, simplistically, through the vehicle of teaching. That assumes you have something to teach. But if you teach to the exclusion of not practicing, that's a problem. Because you really are out of touch with what's happening. How schools, as it turns out, problematically, in my point of view, from my point of view, have been too much like practice. Many people in practice feel that a school's sole purpose or primary purpose is to prepare young men and women to practice. That's not true. The primary purpose of education is to endow the young with an ethical sense to be able to answer complex questions when they get out in practice. For example, I personally loathe architects forensically who testify in court against other architects. We have such a person in the Chicago chapter of my age precisely, whose name shall be unspoken. Um, you can't really, I don't really appreciate architects uh, taking a position in court against other architects. I really don't. So I have a problem with that. I think the ethical issue is at the root of architectural education. It's not professional practice. It's not design, even. It's really about ethics. You're supposed to learn this stuff from your mommy and your daddy. But if you don't, you have to get it somewhere. And you cannot go into a profession like architecture without that. I, I use, excuse me, I use the word profession. Now, in the AI, I have a problem. You'll see um, Zurich, who's in DC now, I guess the convention's in Washington, asked me to write. He's starting to ask some people to write something for their journal, a little 300-word piece to get whatever's on your mind off your chest or whatever. So you'll see what I wrote about that subject. I think that um, 
you need to be ethically inclined as an architect. You need to be ethically inclined as a human being, but particularly as an architect. In other words, doing the bidding of, say, a real estate developer who is simplistically, generally speaking, a bottom feeder, only interested in profit. I mean, where is the conscience behind the building with such a client? So thus you have to have an ethical wherewithal. You have to be able, how do I say this cogently, to say no and still get something built. Sounds easy, very tough. How do you say no and get something built is really the question. So I think ethics are a part of education, part of, and, and frankly, a part of architecture and education. Actually, it's interesting to me. My son went to the University of Chicago B School, and they had a course, they had two courses available on ethics. So why is it that generally, simplistically, architecture schools have no courses on ethics? I think that's a problem. And it shows an interest in this stuff. I mean, you all know whether the recession of our time or not. Architecture has basically been following the money. Go where the money is. So in OPEC in the 70s, you would find SOM, Bruce Graham, all of them, uh, in Iran. And in South Africa, even after the United States came down heavily against apartheid, architects were still seeking work in South Africa. And then it changed, and now it's in various places, China, India, etc. cetera. Um, and there, it, there's a, it's a hallowed tradition about following the money. The Chicago Fire, it began then in history. What do you think Louis Sullivan and P.B. White were? They were ambulance chasers. They came here from the East Coast because the goddamn place burned down, and they needed architects. And so that's in, it's a part of our tradition. At the very same time that we revere the Chicago School, which I do too, of course, uh, they were out here to do work. So I've always had a problem with that kind of thing. I have never focused, in a focused sense, marketed. Sure, we published our work, but we've never consciously if we know of a job, I make sure that I avoid trying to contact such a person. But now, major architecture firms, and not so major firms, all have marketing directors. And now, thanks to Eva Maddox, we have branding as well. So architects are talking about that. What does branding really mean? This is branding. The McDonald's arches, right? So. I realize, listen, this is all the ravings of a very old man. <laughs> this is not my time, and I understand that. And I think God in his wisdom made sure that we died at a certain age. So I really don't want to see where this field is going in another 25 or 50 years, because I fear for it. Unless there's an ethical basis by which you make judgments, and that's why teaching is really important. You have to be able to make sure that you teach that to the young. But then you have to also make sure that it's Im implicit in your own work and in your own life and in your behavior. I appreciate your comment, your question about nature. Um, but you can find it in many places, not just in nature. But I'm not sure that we're at a stage right now that you can find it in the computer. So, I mean, I was just on the same Frank Gehry's jury at Yale, and Greg Lynn, who was the other side of the coin, his jury as well. And the work was, Metz and Metz, was not so great. It was all computer driven, of course, not all, but mostly. And occasionally a kid would show a huge amount of work of drawing. 
And I thought, wow, that's fabulous. Actually, as a sign of the times, of the problem of the times, at the opening, you know, the show that I have at the Graham Foundation began at Yale virtually a year ago, 10 months ago. When it opened at the Graham, several young people in school came up and were wowed by all the drawings that I had. And that's a tragedy. I mean, of course I draw. I mean, I was trained to draw, so I draw. Uh, and I can put myself, whatever there is inside, into my work through the vehicle of drawing. I don't see that with the computer, if you want the honest to God truth. It just doesn't, there is no soul. I mean, I hate to talk about abstractions like soul or uh, the ineffable, the unutterable. But we all know what I'm talking about, whether you know how to attain it or not. I think you do it, if you really want to get serious, to get involved with such things, you do it by thinking, not by rattling stuff off. Actually, that from a person who has been as action-oriented as anybody, but it's actually the time that you have by yourself, that you sit and you think while you work, that's really crucial. Now, how to convey these things to a student, to the young, is a part of education. And I assume that those of you who are on this education committee are interested in such things. Those of you that aren't on the education committee, I would think you'd be interested in, in the, these things anyway. How you get to the source of what makes you design in a certain way, let's say. I remember I had a professor at Yale, an Asian chap, who kept saying, you have to dig down deeply, Stanley, which I didn't understand at the time, and was not capable, frankly, of doing, of looking at myself. But with age, if you live long enough, the key to the whole goddamn thing is health. You have to live long enough that you have time so that you can see what it is you're doing and think about what you're doing. I hate to be this abstruse with such a committee, but those are what my interests are. Many years ago, probably in the 80s, Margaret McCurry's father, Paul McCurry, who was an architect, was involved with the NCRB and basically ran, was the governing person for the state examination at that time to become a registered architect. He asked me to grade the architecture design part of it at that time, in the 80s. And I want to tell you, at that time, the stuff I saw was so horrific, virtually all of it. First of all, nobody could draw. Nobody could letter. You, I mean, if you looked at the stuff, you think, did these guys go through architecture school? It was shocking. Forget design. Yes, the design was crap, but they couldn't, they couldn't draw, they couldn't letter. So now you have a machine that you, put, you input something and out comes a perfect appearing drawing with perfect appearing lettering, right? That doesn't say anything about you at all, zero. You're inputting information and it comes out perfect. And it's fabulous as a tool, make no mistake. I love it. Kid, I mean, this house I'm working on, in two seconds, is going to be given to a kid. He'll put it on the computer, come back, it'll be perfect. I'll make a gazillion changes. Two seconds later, I'll bring it back, it'll also be perfect. So the machine turns out these beautiful looking things. Um, but that doesn't mean that the person 
making the stuff knows what beauty is. That's for sure. So, I mean, obviously, I have my predilection is toward drawing. Now, it turns out, if you spend what in my case is some 65 years or more of drawing, of course I can draw. I can draw beautifully. I can letter perfectly. But that's to be expected. I've been doing it all my life. That, you know, you wouldn't ask Arnold Palmer to play tennis. It's what I do. It's my, pro my problem with the machine, I know this is a fact, is that you look at the stuff coming out today. I mean, I'm just, it was just on juries at Yale, arguably a good school. And the stuff was just okay in terms of design. It all looked perfect, if you, I mean, in terms of line weight, lettering, and so forth. But the young people working on it had no clue. So I'm not so sure. I mean, because now you can turn out stuff that looks perfect, but is it perfect? So it, it really depends. I mean, obviously, you can you programs like Rhino or whatever. You can do anything. You can rotate things. Topologically, it's spectacular, no doubt. Even, for example, in Margaret McCurry's case, since her work is simplistically symmetrical, let's say. What's on the left is on the right. So the machine is perfect for that. She only has to draw what's on the left. The machine just dupes it and it comes out perfectly. So, and she loves it. But I'm, I, you know, he asked a question, it did, Mr. Technology over there with the uh, video. Um, am I going to learn this stuff? No, I'm too old now. I do what I do. But the office turns out fabulous looking stuff. But the, the amount of time that we have to put in, as we have always had to put in, to turn it into what we consider good design. So, you know, what is good design? There are things, that's why you have things like the AIA, to premiate it. So if you don't publish your work, if you don't win awards, if you don't build, what are you doing? There are methods there by which we can measure each other. We give each other awards for what we think, a jury thinks, is good work. But I'm not sure, you know, the stuff I'm talking about, like aura, the unstated, unspeakable in architecture, um, is something that is not so easy to come by. Not so easy as to input stuff into a machine. So if you learn BIM, does it assure you that it's going to be a terrific building? I don't think so. If Frank Lloyd Wright had access to a computer, the, sim the simpler thing is to say, if Mies had access to a computer, would the things turn out to be as beautiful as they were? Answer is yes. But what about the descendants of Mies, the psychophants, the acolytes, the SOMs, and so forth? If you have a person like Helmut Jan, it's going to come out great. If you had a person like Bruce Graham, great. If you have others, should I name the others at Skidmore? that are not so great. They wouldn't have been great without a computer, and they're not great with a computer. And the question is, why do you do things? And this always creeps in. You, you know, my problem with the profession of architecture is the word profession. Profession means prostitutes do it for money. Okay? Do I make myself clear? The word amateur, amateur, Ama, the etymology of the prefix ama, is about love. Do you do it for love or do you do it for money? Mies van der Rohe was innately ethical. He had 20 people his entire career. Not 21, not 19, he had 20. So I was there in his office. We were working on the project in Montreal at the time, on Nuns Island. Uh, and I was talking to his business manager, who had a little back room with a chart. This is long before the computer. And the typical bar chart, which showed where they were. And so Mies was being asked by the Krupp Works in Germany to do an office building. So he came in in his wheelchair, and I stood to one side with these guys in black suits. And Mies looked at the chart and said, 
yeah, I can do the project in three years. But he just kept them on, the same 20 guys, busy, not busy, whatever. The same people worked. If you work in Japan, as I knew a couple of kids who were at school with me, if you get a job in, say, Fumiko's Maki's office in Tokyo, it's a lifetime job. You may not be aware of that. You don't get laid off. If Maki has less work, you're still there, and you still get paid. So ethics is something I think you need to give a little thought to. That and the subject of aura. What is this unstatable thing that makes something actually important to you, aesthetically speaking, poetically speaking? So the ethics and poetics is the whole gig, as far as I'm concerned. That's just my view, but that's all I care about. Oh, it's actually far beyond that. When, you know, you see the cane. I've had some problems over the last three, four years. And the Rehab Institute, the woman that I've been working with over time, her husband is an architect, and he was fired, and he's now doing physical rehab stuff. But I think there's another issue, and I've had this discussion with Zurich Esposito, the question of ethics. I would urge all of you, as soon as you're done here, go back to your laptop and break out the AIA Code of Ethics. Take a look at it. Are you all utterly familiar with it? No. It opens up with what? With the Justice Department thing that says, let me start this another way. I've been an AIA member for whatever it is, 50 years now. When I joined the AIA, believe it or not, the Code of Ethics said you couldn't undercut fees. You couldn't displace another architect without advising the architect first. You couldn't advertise. The Code of Ethics today starts out by saying, you can undercut fees. You, the Justice Department stepped in, I'll tell you why. And it says you can, you, you can displace another architect. You don't have to let him know. You can advertise. And this came about because the Justice Department had a lawsuit against the AIA nationally, but it was against the Chicago chapter. Yeah, so was Margaret, so was Eva Maddox. So you know, you know the whole history. Yeah, it's the Tom Ironman story about setting, f fixing fees. Um, so the justice, it's interesting, it's, it's important that you all reread the Constitution and you'll find nothing qualitative in it. It's quantitative. I mean, because this is a free-based capitalist society. So you have, you, have to have an ethical, you have to have an ethical pursuit within you. It's not going to be given to you by the government. You have to break the law to get in trouble. OK? So that's not the profession I signed up to. So it doesn't, I mean, but it is going in that direction. I'm aware of it. And it's just a cry in the wilderness, and I'm aware of that, too. Uh, but I have nothing against the machine. The machine is great. The computer is great. No question about it. No doubt about it. But you still have to spend the time. It doesn't really reduce the time. Everybody thinks it does from a profit point of view. But it doesn't reduce the time that it takes to turn out really good design. That still takes time. And whether or not you can draw. I mean, I am interested in drawing. But I grant you that most aren't, because they never learned it. And now they don't need to learn it. Well, let me first talk a little bit about IIT. I was on a jury down there, probably the end of the year. And the guy teaching the jury was a friend of mine, shall remain unnamed. And he had given a big a project to the kids of a tall building. He sat there the whole time on this goddamn thing. He didn't even, it was, he was text messaging for his work in China or whatever, okay? I found that shocking. In other words, he didn't give a shit about the student to even talk to the student about their project. That's a problem. The integrated stuff is great. That sounds like a great thing. 
That's what we try to do at ArchiWorks. ArchiWorks is probably going down. I mean, it's in trouble. But it was a good idea. I mean, everything lasts for a time. Nothing is forever. Everything is a metaphor of life and death. Ultimately, it all fails. But it was a very good idea at the time. It was needed, which is to say, architecture in the context of social cause. Does that mean that you didn't get low-cost housing projects in school? Not at all. Every University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana was fabulous at giving those kinds of projects all the time. But did that stuff, the innovative stuff, find its way into practice? Not really. It took Sam Mockby and a variety of others and Archieworks to sort of bring attention to such a thing. So, you know, I grant you we're, we're practicing in a free-based capitalist society, but I also have to pay rent. And I also have to pay employees, etc. But that's of no interest to me. I mean, that we pay the employees, we pay rent, but that's a byproduct of what we do. That's not the reason what we do. I'm not getting work to keep a payroll up. I mean, yes, we're down. We were always forever, it seems, 10 people. We're now seven. But I didn't lay those people out. They, people attrit. They leave for other reasons. But in this tough time, I never replaced them. But we were always 10. So we, I've never, I mean, sure, we have to meet the payroll. But I've never, for it's been now, thank God, 40 years since I've had to borrow money, etc. cetera. Um, but I don't, everything I'm telling you, it's the way I run my practice and my life. I'm not saying you should do it, but I do think if you ought to teach. And you, if you teach, you need to think about an ethical pursuit in the vehicle of your work, how you come to such things. And that will bring you back to who you, you are. And when you dig down deep inside who you really are, when you look in the mirror every morning, who are you really? Only you know who you are. I mean, I'm, when you left Genzer to open up your own practice, that was great. I remember many years ago, many years ago, it's got to be, Christ, almost 50 years ago, I had a kid in the office who had gone to UIC, and he'd left and he was on he was working for some other firm or something. And he called me up and said, can I sit down with you? I said, sure. He came to the office. And you know, students and teachers are like parents and children. I knew pretty well what he was going to say. And he basically said, what are the chances? I knew what he meant. And what are the chances he would survive if he opened up his own practice? I said, well, if you're willing to work 18 hours a day, uh, do whatever is needed, 5%. And he left and opened up his own practice. And he's still in practice today. In other words, it took a certain amount of courage. This is a field, it's another thing that isn't talked about very often, it's about bravery. I mean, saying no to a client ain't easy. Try it sometime. Say no and still get it built. That's what good design is, saying no and still getting it built. So it takes a certain amount of courage. So I admire you doing it, for sure.